Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin this very exciting evening here at Tech Wednesday. Uh, thank you all for coming to Innovation Campus this evening. The eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that I'm not Michelle Rayner. Um, I'm actually Mike Bander from Turn Partners, um, and I'm filling in um, uh, hopefully just as well as Michelle can conduct tonight's activities. Um, just by show of hands, who uh, here is on their first Tech Wednesday? Uh, amazing. And out of you guys, who here is the first trip to Innovation Birmingham? Nice. Newbies in the house. So current people, be nice to newbies. Now, I've got a, a list of some boring things to say, so let me just fly through them. Um, health and safety is what it says. So just be really safe in, in here and <laughs> healthy. Um, there's no fire alarms due tonight. So if the fire alarms go run as fast as you can and out of any door. There's windows all behind here. Just leg it out of there. That's absolutely fine. That's right, Peter. <laughs> Peter's face. Okay, no, the fire exits are at the... At this door. Yeah. At the Follow Pia. She's a fast runner. I've seen her. Um, now, it's really important. Um, next, the nearest exits was the bit that was really important. Um, so Tech Wednesday is a monthly meetup which has been going for many, many years now. Um, it started in the kitchen of E4F down the corridor where we've all seen. And it started actually as a breakfast event where I first met Dan, believe it or not, one of our speakers this evening. Um, and from humble beginnings, it's grown into a meeting of minds where we hear about the good, the bad and the ugly of the uh, tech startup scene in Birmingham and beyond. So uh, welcome if you've not been before. Please do get involved in the conversation. We're at Tech Wednesday, at InnoBham or just hashtag Tech Wednesday. We've got a Twitter full wall on the screen, um, and it's always good to, to give yourself a little uh, cheer and celebration when you make it onto the wall, um, only if we're in between talks, of course. So um, just a quick note about uh, E4F, who actually runs this event. Now, E4F, uh, can we just see a show of hands of people currently on E4F, and people who've been through E4F? Okay, a few people. E4F is actually a technology incubator based here at Innovation Birmingham. Um, they run a nine-month program taking on technology companies and incubating them from idea um, or basic concept all the way through to pre-accelerator and quite often onto accelerator. Um, it's a really short application process, I'm told. Um, so you just gotta you just gotta believe me on that one. It's obviously based here in the West Midlands, uh, and it's all about creating jobs. Um, so creating jobs for, for you within your businesses and also building your business to, to help create other jobs. Um, it's nine months of absolute <laughs> free facilities. Um, so if you're looking for office space and you think you might qualify for the tech incubator, it's nine months free with all of us friendly faces in E4F down the corridor. Um, along uh, with the office space, you get a whole host of other packages. Um, I've actually been through the incubator and I can honestly say it's been really, really valuable. Um, you get fantastic mentors, um, you get great training workshops, and uh, uh, part of a really vibrant community. I'm seeing some nodding heads, which is, which is always good. If you don't fancy joining the Tech Incubator, we also have flexible packages. We, as in them, have flexible packages. And you need to speak to either Naomi <laughs> and Pia. Um, and they offer things all the way from having an address here, based up to having a big office space um, or whatever you need. Um, you can also have free hot, uh, hot desk in spaces within the E4F um, office, and uh, they do one week's free trial. So if you fancy coming hanging out for a week, uh, that's good. There is more that I need to say about it, but I don't need to read this because uh, I kind of know the benefits of E4F. The community really is phenomenal. Uh, and it's not just the fact that we get to work alongside other people, it's the fact that we get to problem solve with other people. Um, so even if you are just coming in for the one week, there's always people within the office spaces that have had problems and are going through problems that you have had or will have. So just firing a question or, or opening a discussion is always a great way of getting to some solutions. That is all I'm going to say about E4F. In short, it's good, join. Um, and if you're looking for office space, it's also good, join. Um, now, this evening, I am very excited to be hosting because we have three fantastic speakers. Uh, first off, we have Wakar Shah, CEO and founder of Super Meal, um, the fiercest competition that Just Eat have ever seen, and Wakar's going to show us a bit about that with a, uh, a nice little competition. Uh, we also have Tom, uh, co-founder and CTO, I believe, of Syndicate Room. Um, and we also have my good friend, Dr. Ice, also known as Daniel Rice, who is the previous founder of uh, Hobsey. 
Now, this is going to be slightly different uh, than any other Tech Wednesday meetings because this is actually um, a tech funeral. We're going to look at why Hobbsy is no longer Hobbsy. So really, really looking forward to that. We're also going to hear from three of you. Um, you all have an opportunity to do a one-minute introduction and pitch. So if you've not been here before, in between each of the speakers, throw your hands up. We've got a couple of people down already. Uh, and you have one minute, and we're being strict on times, just to say who you are, what you're looking for, what you like to do, anything you like. So, without further ado, the man whose phone's ringing is about to come and entertain us for 10 minutes. Um, so, I would like to welcome to the stage, Waka Shah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mike. You, are, you just you made me nervous, you know. Right, so my name is Vokal Shah. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Supermeal. Uh, I'll tell you what Supermeal is. Uh, this is our uh, handle for Twitter, uh, Supermeal UK, and you can use the hashtag Tech Ministry. Uh, the company behind Supermeal is called Vokal Tech Limited. Uh, we started this business in 2008 and 2009. Uh, I'm ex-British Telecom, so I started giving software outsourcing services to the people in BT. Uh, so I've got a team of 30, 40 engineers offshore, and uh, they are on a payroll. And uh, the type of projects we've done, we've deployed to businesses like O2 in Ireland, Vodafone, KPMG, uh, Glendia, and Post Microsoft. And there are many other clients. Uh, we've been running SuperMeal since August 2012 in Asia. Uh, that's in Pakistan. We've got customers like Domino's, uh, McDonald's, KFC, Subways as international brands. Uh, and we've got lots of local brands as well. We gone live in the UK on 3rd of June. That was our launch. Uh, it was very busy here, you know, lots of restaurants offering lots of free food as well. So Supermeal is the next generation mobile takeaway ordering service. There are two types of customer in this business. Uh, one is the B2B. Uh, it's us, the Supermeal and the restaurants. And the other is B2C, uh, the consumers, obviously, you know, people who's gonna place order to these restaurants. So it's one website, loads of restaurants around you. Uh, it's a location-based service. Uh, we've got Android app as well, uh, responsive website and all that. So the top level features for restaurants, uh, we have super meal Android app for them to manage the business remotely. Uh, Cloud-based back office admin access they have, so they can change their prices, photos, right responses to the customers, and lots of things, you know, it's, it's very busy. There's a follow feature just like Twitter. So if a customer follow a restaurant, then if, there is, if that restaurant create a deal or offer anything, this customer will get notification either by SMS or mobile notification or email. There's a deal and discount support. So they can, the restaurants can create deals and vouchers and all that. They can do branded SMSs. They can print the receipts on Epson printer. They are strategic partner. Uh, the launch on 3rd of June was basically uh, sponsored by Epson. Uh, and the credit card chip and pin device for the restaurants. There's so many features, other many features for restaurants. I'm gonna cover a few in a video. Mike, you're gonna help me with this? Sure. You actually told me to close the videos. Where are they? <laughs> They're on the desktop. So you're gonna give me my 15 seconds back, yeah? No, no, we're on strict <laughs> time here. So Bottom open, one. Let's open uh, this one. If you only had a few customers, keeping them loyal and happy would be easy. Haven't heard from them in a while? Give them a call. Want to know what they think about your business? Ask them. They have an upcoming appointment? Remind them. Your customers would think you're so great, they'd probably tell the whole world. Wouldn't having only a few customers be great? Not really. Your business cannot survive with just a few customers. So you have to add more. And you'd love to have even more than that. But every new customer you get takes away attention from existing customers. As you grow, your attention is spread thinner and thinner. Soon, existing customers aren't as satisfied as they used to be. Your business growth slows, and so does revenue. But you're too busy to do anything about it. Hiring more employees is expensive, and cloning yourself is impractical. So you start to think that maybe now your business is as good as it can possibly get. Think again. Think Supermill. 
Supermill allows you to add your customers to your online database, equipping you to give every customer the attention they need. Each order your customer places online on Supermill, you get instant notification on your tablet, mobile or printer. Your customer gets instant order confirmation via SMS or mobile notification. This way you get to manage thousands of orders easily on your mobile and on the go. With this customer database, you can generate reports by area, by spending, by age and many more. Communicate with them using the Supermill marketing tool. Haven't heard from them in a while? Send them branded SMS with your business name. Need to communicate with some or all of your customers? Send them unlimited newsletters, promotions and campaigns. Or send them personalized emails on every occasion. Your reach to your customers is easy with just a few clicks. Then they help you build your reputation and spread the word. Whenever they place an order with you, you ask them for a review. Supermill automatically syndicates it all over the internet, so you can effortlessly expand your online reputation. So now, all of your existing customers are getting all the attention they need. And you get to benefit from the Supermill network, with thousands of local consumers near you, and you can get them all to follow you. With Supermill, you can grow confidently, because no matter how many new customers you get, Supermill enables you to treat them as if they were the only one. Contact supermill.co.uk for a demo today. Brilliant. Right. So, can you hear me? Right. So, uh, thank you. The features that we saw are for the restaurants. Uh, Super Meal is also looking for partners in different cities, by the way. So, we prefer expanding that way. So, if someone is interested to become a Super Meal sales partner, you can speak to me. And then this is the video that we show to many different restaurants and you know bring them on board. The features for consumers, the biggest, everyone asks me, what's the difference between you and Just Eat? And I always tell them there's so many, but few are. The biggest is cashback. The system has got built-in cashback feature. So we can be giving you 5%, 6%, 10% cashback whenever you place order. That money come to you uh, electronically uh, in your super meal uh, electronic wallet. And then you can use that money to pay for your next order or there's a new feature coming in the future you can donate that into charity as well uh, referral so every time you invite your friends you can earn up to 50 pence from the order we've got a video on this i'm going to show you in a bit uh, we call ourselves the google of food because you can search for specific food as well if you want to eat let's say biryani onion bhaji you can search that very easily whereas in uh, just in case you can only see Chinese, Italian and broader level. But in our case you can go for specific food in a specific postcode. Uh, this for consumer this is a profile page and there are many more features. So you're gonna help me again, Mike? Yes. Sir. Thought one? Yeah, please. Once in a busy town. After having his hunger been satisfied. Buzz is a happy super real customer. But now Buzz gets more from Supermill. Supermill offers a referral program. You can now earn up to 50 pence every time your friends order on Supermill. Invite your friends now on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Skype and Google+. Plus or on any social networking website or email service. Earn up to 50 pence in Supermill eCash from every order your friends make. The more they order, the more Supermill eCash you get. Mm, that means my next order can be made using my Supermill eCash. With that more, earn more, and eat more. Uh, Supermill.co.uk, your online food street. Download Supermill.co.uk mobile app now. Okay, so uh, we've got a small competition here. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a page. It's called Launch on Supermill.co.uk. Whoever plays the first order uh, we're going to announce after this presentation at the end they will get this digital camera from us 
Uh, I'm going to skip the, the demo for the website. It's going to take longer. Uh, this is the URL. So if you visit on your mobile phone, superme.co.uk, create account for yourself, place your first order. I'm going to get on my mobile phone, and then we will tell at the end who is the first person who has placed the order. It's not actual, yeah. This launch, this this URL, the launch. It's not actual, order, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. This is was this was skipped. You know, this was skipped the demo. But this launch URL is um, is is Innovation Birmingham Campus page, and we've got this is what we showed on third of June. So we've got twelve restaurants in there, and every item is co costing one pence. So you can order as many as you like. But you know, the competition is that thing. Also, um, at the end. We need a lot of support from you all. So, you know, if you become Super Meal uh, Advocate, we've got some stickers for your cars. Uh, they are reflectors. Uh, and we've got some fun stickers as well. I've got lots of them. So if you need some, please, you know, you can ask me. Uh, thank you very much. If there's any question, you can ask me either, you know, in the uh, after the presentation. Thank you. Now. Thank you very much, Waka. Now you've kind of not going to get any questions. Oh, these are always coming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, orders coming. Nice, exciting. Well, we'll reveal that later. In the meantime, whilst you're all still getting your orders in, uh, we've got a few minutes here to uh, ask some questions from Waka. So, does anyone have any questions? I've got one, Miles. Oh, no, sure. Um, yeah, my name's Adrian Cole, Night Owls Express. Do you guys um, serve drinks as well as food? Or I know I was, I was meant to speak to you soon as well, but because um, we're an out of hours convenience store online, we're an online convenience store. Is it possible for us to do a partnership with yourself? Uh, yeah, we can sell literally anything in our offshore operation in supermeal.pk. We've got businesses selling frozen food, so they sell fish as well, frozen. Uh, so you can literally sell anything, sweets, anything you like. Sell toiletries and things like that, so you'll, you'll just pick it up from my location. No, we'd, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. Super Meal is just a middleman yeah. between the restaurant and the customer, so we do not do any deliveries, yeah. and we try to keep away, you know, ourselves from that sort of process. We just yeah. send the order to the business, and then give the customer details as well, and then they speak to them. Okay. First question led to uh, diversification from mills to toiletries. Can we top that with a second question? I wanted to ask how you came up with the name Wacar Tech, really. <laughs> Appoint an ad agency for that one. <laughs> any, any other real questions? Uh, yeah, right in the back. It's a minor one, but um, you don't have superbeam.com, do you? Are you going to buy that or do you not bother you? Someone bought it, so we're waiting, you know, for it to expire. But yeah, hopefully, we'll once we get some money, we'll bid for it and we'll buy it. If you got it, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a question at the front, James. What's the main challenge you face moving the company from uh, Asian market into, into the UK? Uh, what's the biggest challenge for us? There's no challenge. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are born ready. I'm telling you. So, uh, yeah, to be honest, there's no challenge. The biggest challenge is uh, finding the right partners, to be honest. It's all about people. Uh, since 2008, my biggest uh, card is my people. You know, I always spend too much time, too much money on them. So we're going to build the same team here and uh, give them lots of parties and, you know, lots of free vouchers on Super Meal. Any other questions from the, from the crowd? No, okay, thank you very much, Rakar, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, as a little interlude in the big presentations, we have a, uh, a one-minute pitch, mixing it up a bit this evening. So, can I invite Tim from Code Club to the stage? One minute. One minute. Do you want to come up here, Tim? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Cool, sir. I'm out of the way of the projector now. Sure. Cool. So, hi, my name's Tim Wilson, and I'm the regional coordinator of Co Club. How many of you have heard of Co Club? Cool. So, a few of you. So, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a nationwide network of free after-school coding clubs for kids aged nine to uh, nine to eleven. We have a really simple and flexible model, 
We recruit volunteers, such as yourselves, who go into venues such as schools, uh, community centres and libraries for one hour per week for a minimum of one term to teach kids to code. We have projects which teach, which teach the children how to code, how to make computer games, how to do animations, how to make websites. Our projects cover Scratch to teach the basics of programming. They move through to CSS and HTML for websites. And then we move on to things like Python. Uh, we also have a GitHub profile. We like to share many of our projects and encourage our volunteers to upload their own projects as well. Basically, in a nutshell, I'd like to put a code club into every school in the region. This is about developing the future of creativity, the future skills of the region. And I'm looking for volunteers and champions to help me. So I value support. I'll be around afterwards to uh, answer your questions. And thank you. Oh. Is there anyone in the room that thinks that they could get involved in Code Club? It sounds like a, a good thing. Just, yeah, cool. We've got, we've got hands here, Tim. Nick, Nick holds our hand up. Get him after. Okay, so next up we have Tom. Uh, co-founder and CTO of Syndicate Room. Welcome, Tom. Excellent. This works. Who is raising or looking to raise money from business angels in the next couple of months? Okay, everybody else, you can go. <laughs> this is tailored to, uh, to that. Um, my name is Tom. I'm a co-founder at Syndicate Room. We're a hybrid platform for raising money from angels and the crowd. Um, in the last two years, we've helped raise over 25 million. We only work with companies who have lead investors on boards who are business angels and who need a top up of their funding round. So tonight, I thought I would talk about you know, the 10 commandments of raising money from business angels. And I think the first commandment that I didn't put on here was spell check your presentation. I didn't do that, so apologies if you see a few mistakes. Number one, know thy audience like the back of thy hand. And when I say audience for this, I mean who you're pitching to. So for those out there who are looking to find angels, angels invest in different things, not angels invest in every industry. Don't waste your time going to an angel who's not going to be interested in what you have to offer. Um, it'll waste your time in theirs. It'll leave a bad taste in your mouth. And six months down the line, you'll have gotten nowhere. So as much as angels do due diligence on a company, do your due diligence on whether it's an angel or a VC or whoever it is that you're pitching to. Learn what they look for and then tailor your presentation to that. Now, I'm not saying if you're a super meal, become a software developer uh, of car applications or whatever, but tailor it to what they need. Are they more data people? Are they more personal people? Are they more team type people? If you can find that and if you can look at what they've invested in in the past and get a sense of what they're looking for, Make sure you add that to your presentation. Tell thy story. Your story is just as important as the data that you're using. People invest in numbers, but they also invest in people. They want to know what makes you different. They want to know what makes you special. They want to know where you've come from and why you can achieve what you say you're going to achieve. So make sure you include a bit about yourself and how you're going to be able to deliver it. I've seen so many pitches where people go, the market's this big, and we're building this great thing, and it's blah, 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 but they don't see any, say anything about themselves, and that really kills the deal. Praise thy team. I've seen so many founders, usually, and CEOs come up and say, I'm amazing. I do this. I'm going to do that. I'm blah, blah, blah. And they never mention the team that supports them. Most angels that we work with don't intend to invest in single uh, person companies. They look for a strong team and a background of the team. So make sure whenever you're pitching, you talk about your team and how great they are. Cherish the target market. Um, this is all about knowing who your customer is and knowing them inside and out, how much they're worth to you, how much they're going to cost to be acquired, um, what they eat for breakfast, what type of clothes they like to wear. If you can get a very detailed outline of who you're going after, that's much better than going into a room and just saying, our target audience um, is men between 20 and 40, and it's this big. You know, What about them makes them your target as opposed to your competitor's target? Get specific on who you're going after. Number five, show and tell. If you have a product or an app or whatever it is, don't be afraid to present it. 
if you show up to a pitch and you say, we've built, we've built this great uh, GPS device or this great whatever it is, and you don't have it with you, it's going to look really bad. Telematics devices, software apps, to the gentleman I spoke with earlier. Don't read from your deck. You know, how great is a presentation when you're doing this? Um, next, we're going to go into France, and then they know you can read. They don't need you to prove that to them. You know, talk to them. Show them that you know the business. Show them that you know what you've put together. It's not just something that you've done last minute. You know, stand in front of them. Don't, don't have your back um, to them. Be precisely precise. What I mean by this is know exactly how much you need to raise and what you're going to do with it. You don't just say we're going to raise half a million because we need that and we're going to spend a little bit on sales and a little bit on human resources and a little bit on that. Get to the detail of that. Show them that you've thought through the numbers and you know exactly what you need to achieve the goals. You'll probably still be wrong because you'll spend more than you think you will, and they know that too, but it's better to, to show them that you understand all of those costs. Respect that time slot. So if you're given 10 minutes, you know, 9 minutes and 59 seconds, if you go over, you know, it shows that you can't really manage time. You can't manage things. I've got five minutes left. Holy crap, I'm going quick. <laughs> Be under instead of over, if you will. Dress in your Sunday best. So I'm not really dressed in my Sunday best, but you know, we're not all Mark Zuckerbergs out here. We're not all the Facebook, Twitters, or whatever. And if you show up in a hoodie to most of the angels, especially in the UK, because it's kind of a cultural thing, it's not going to look too well. I don't care what it is you're selling or what it is you've made. If you don't look like you want to do it or you, you know about it, it's, it's going to look bad on you. Um, sorry to say that because most of us are tech entrepreneurs. I'm a CTO. You know, I wish I could wear my, jam my pajamas to work. It doesn't work out that way. The other thing is like when you're in your office, this is a sidetrack, but um, you know, an investor could stop by at any point in time. You know, just a little thing that I've learned recently. And if you're pretty dressed down and the office is a bit of a mess, it doesn't look good on you. Um, I sound like a parent now, but we'll forget that. Um, always have an exit plan. So if you think, yeah, we're just going to get big and then we're going to sell to somebody, that's not an exit plan. An exit plan is working out who might buy you, how you're going to list, when you're going to list, and get specific on that. You know, there are so many people who say, yeah, we're just, you know, in the U.S. it's kind of, it's a little bit different than here, but people just say, we're going to get big, we're going to have a million people on the platform, and then Google will probably buy us because we've got a lot of data. Um, we don't really see that happening over here in the U.K. too much. So know how you're going to get out and know how the investor is going to get money back to them because that's what they care about, or most of them. So I've ran through this. Um, Syndicate Room, like I said, is a, is a platform where we help angels and entrepreneurs raise finance. Um, the biggest lessons that I've, I've learned from pitches is preparedness and knowing the numbers. So if I could highlight a few of those points, really drill down into your data and your key KPIs. I mentioned it to some of the people earlier, but get specific on your KPIs, particularly on how much it costs you to acquire a customer. So who here is doing a software pitch? Anybody? Software plays? Who's doing a product play? Just one. What's everybody else doing? <laughs> A service of some sorts. That's a technically a software play, but um, sorry. So those guys who are you mentioned you're developing a product. What is it? Uh, fast battery charger. Fast battery. What's it called? Uh, Petline Plus. Petline Plus. And how much does it cost you to make that? Twenty dollars. And how much do you sell it for? Fifty. Okay, that's a good margin. But can you get that cost down? How can you get it down? <laughs> Scale, right? Okay, so you've got a, a kind of an understanding. Is it offshored? You know, getting it in China? Okay, cool. Okay, and how much does it cost you to acquire a customer? $18. So $18, $20 for the cost, 38, 12 pounds profit. Cool. Okay, so I'm just giving you a sample of, you know, get down to those details. And I'm not gone very specifically here. I've got two minutes left. <laughs> and who, software plays. Who is a software play? Or a service or a social network or whatever it is. Yeah, so what are you doing? Uh, so our kind of main business, we, we've just launched uh, an Instagram scheduling app called popperhq.com today, but well, our main business is a, a dating agency. Dating agency. Yeah. Uh, competitive, right? Very. What's your cost of acquisition? Um, 
my business partners over there probably wouldn't like me to say, but it's uh, it's around eighty pounds. Eighty pounds. Yeah. And once you get someone on board, what's your lifetime value of a customer? One hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty. Okay, double. Yeah. Cool. So you've gone through all the numbers. You're starting to work everything out, yeah. and you've pitched already, or you haven't We're pitched. Not for funding. You're not looking for funding. Self-funded. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Who's looking for funding that has a question? <laughs> this has been bad. <laughs> Spoke to you earlier. Yeah. yeah. There we go. How do you get? Um, in, in a 10-minute slot, how do you project or get everything across what you just talked about? Yeah. Well, some of that is appearance and preparedness and getting your numbers down. Um, when I pitched and when we used to pitch, we would start with our story that's a little bit about the market and about the benefit that we bring to the market. So the biggest thing you can tell an investor is, what is your customer's benefit or what are you giving to them that no one else kind of can or that you do differently so it's always start like with syndicate room you know, we're the only network that helps angels close funding rounds we're the only network that offers our investors the same economic terms as the lead investors you know most of the time when someone invests through a fund they're getting charged fees for that well the fund manager is taking the credit and the carry and management fees so we're trying to disrupt and break down the barriers between kind of funds and alternative finance and mainstream finance but we set it up. You know, in the UK, there's about three billion pounds that goes into early stage ventures. You know, it's this big, blah, 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 blah. We think that we can capture 10% of that through our platform by doing it in this way. This is why we can capture that 10%. You know, I've got an IT background, my blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's picture, kind of move into the team and why we can reach the numbers that we wanted. And that generally is about five, six, seven minutes. And we have barely, barely just covered the solution. So we're just talking about the problem, how we're going to solve it. And then, and by the way, this is the platform. Give a quick demo of it and how it works. And this is what we're looking to raise. We always end on how much we're looking to raise, or we used to end on how much we're looking to raise. Um, I don't know if that's the right structure, but we ended up getting funding, and we tweaked our, our, um, our pitch deck you know, probably 14 or 15 times before we got it right, and that seemed to work. I think I'm done on time, but I'll take more questions. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. Yeah. So, does anyone else have any, any other questions? Yes, Lee. We've got road in mind, so well, yeah. Um, we recently uh, raised and started our product launch on Indiegogo, so a different crowdfunding platform. Um, one of the cavats with, with that is that Technically, you, you, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors to begin with to get this sort of momentum build it up. So, uh, build it, build up. Um, so, the, for example, one of their suggestions is that you have to have 30% of the target money secured within 24 hours, for example. So, it goes to the front of their page and then you get this, this build up. How is Syndicate Room structured and does the same sort of things apply? So, if I was looking for an angel investor and they can put in 20% of what I was looking for is it similar in terms of the momentum that you see yeah so we require that 25% come from the lead investment group as validity of the valuation so if a lead investor or lead investment group says look we're gonna put in a hundred grand or 250 or whatever it is because at this valuation we tend to think that that valuation is accurate you know, what you see on other platforms is the entrepreneurs create the valuation and then try and sell it and if you're an entrepreneur, as I am, you know, I'd love to think that my company is a billion pound company, but the angels have recently told me it's about an eight million pound company. You know, the gap's about this big. So once you have that social proof um, from the lead investors or with the rewards uh, program from other investors, you know, it tends to create that momentum. We never list more than five or six opportunities at any point in time because we have an audience who doesn't have the time to sort through 40 or 50 or 100 campaigns. So we curate it to ensure that everyone has got presence. And when an investor goes to it, they, they don't get inundated with, maybe this one, maybe that one. So we, we narrow that um, slightly different model. And um, just a quick number one, in terms of the, the paperwork that you do, so you get everything signed off by the lead investor in terms of the, the terms and things like that, mm -hmm. um, does that then t just copy over to the next lot of investors? Pretty much. Um, minor exceptions being our members can be contacted electronically, can vote electronically, and anything that can make efficiency within that process. So um, we don't want you to have to send them a message and or an, a letter by the post and have them sign it and then send it back because that takes time. So we've tried to remove out those inefficiencies. Thank you. Sure. Typically, um, 
Wait, wait, wait. It's because you're recording and they don't get your question on. Thank you. Um, typically, um, what stage or what level of maturity are the organisations that come to you and that make it onto your front page? Onto our front page. Everyone gets on the front page because <laughs> there's only five or six. Right. Um, we tend to work with companies that have already done a round. So we're generally second, third, Series A round. Um, there are lots of crowdfunding platforms out there. There are 35 in equity. There are probably 100 in rewards. Um, the other equity platforms don't have the same model. So Crowdcube and Cedars will take you know, from your idea concept stage up to later rounds. Um, we, we only work with high net worth and sophisticated investors, so it's a thousand pound minimum as opposed to 10 pounds. Um, so again, variation there. Um, our, our average round size is about 650,000 um, pounds. I don't know what it is elsewhere, but I would hazard a guess it's quite a bit less. Thank you. Any other questions? We've got one at the back and we've got the the front mic, at the back mic at the front. Where am I going? Can we build the tension? Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Shaking. Just a quick question. I didn't see anything earlier about a cap table. Do you offer, uh, do you re request or advise co uh, companies to be ready to go with their cap table as well? Yeah, so we need to have everything in place before we'll engage a company. So we want to see your cap table. We want to see what your previous rounds are. We want to see who your lead investors are. We do a bit of due diligence on them. Uh, I thought you were going to ask a different question on cap table, so I was preparing an answer. Um, well, go ahead and, and say what your is. Good question. Um, <laughs> does having a large number of investors on your cap table put VCs off later on? No, it doesn't. Um, it used to be that way, probably about two years ago. But now, actually, raising first and second round from a crowd um, is becoming much more normal, and VCs are expecting that. So they can handle it. There's programs that can handle it. Thanks for the question. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, we've probably got time for one more question for Tim. Has anybody... Has any more? Tom, yeah. <laughs> Has anybody thought about doing a crowdfunding round? Whether it be rewards, so Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Equity... Okay, there we go. You did it or you haven't done it yet? No, we're just thinking. Thinking about it. Rewards-based, equity-based, debt? Reward. -based. Okay, and your reason for rewards? Mm -hmm. It's a bit complicated for us because we used to be company A since yeah. we pivoted. Yeah. But we could take company A and offer that as a reward for crowd. Okay. Kind of why not? I give another speech sometimes on rewards versus equity versus debt and all that. Um, rewards, basically, you're pre selling your product, right? You want to test the market. So if you've got a product to sell and you don't want to give up equity, go down a rewards channel. Um, Kickstarter is the largest in the world. Indiegogo is just bigger in the UK. Um, either of those are good platforms, but pay attention to your cost on that because they'll charge 5% plus 5% plus another percent depending upon if you hit your target or not. Um, so, so don't work out that, yeah, we're going to raise 100000 and your business plan is based on 100000 and then you end up paying 10% or more to them. You, know, you only have 90000 then. So keep that in mind. I'll be around afterwards if anyone has any other sure. questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Give that for Tom. Thank you. Sorry about one more time. Okay, now for those of you who are here, who are here just for the pizza, we are over halfway through, so it's getting ever closer. <laughs> and there's many faces in the room that, that know who you are. Um, we have time now for, we're coming to Mike at the very end for a one minute, one minute pitch, but we have space for someone to volunteer themselves for 60 seconds of fame. We've, we we have two early hands that go up. Can we fit two in? <laughs> we'll, we'll stretch to a minute and a half and give you 45 seconds. I'll, I'll owe you 30 seconds. Would you like to come up first? And and so for speed, do you want to come up first? And we can switch straight over also as well. And we'll switch straight over. So if you both come to the front. What was your name, sorry? Adrian. Adrian and? Breen. Breen. Pauline. Pauline. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we're going straight to Adrian. Off you go. Okay, um, yeah, my name is Adrian Kimberley. I'm the founder of InSpace. Uh, we're a brand new social network. Um, so we took a step back. We found out, uh, you know, what's wrong, what, what, what are people not like with current social media. And this is uh, the content that gets pushed to them. This is uh, all the friends. Uh, you know, people have like 1,500 friends on Facebook. I mean, <laughs> what even is that? Um, you know, the targeted marketing is actually pretty poor. Um, so we found a new way to connect people where we can actually. Um, uh, you know, separating people off into like interests and personalities, um, as well as uh, <coughs> then transferring this to the targeted marketing side, which means uh, 
then we can have a much more uh, targeted marketing. Um, so basically what I'm looking for is a final partner, a uh, developer. Uh, we have pretty much everything on the way, um, all the background work, uh, route to market, uh, the rest of the team. Um, we have a product being developed and we just need somebody else uh, on board. Cool. Thank you very much for running for time. I'm Pauline, I'm the co-founder of Appletin. Appletin is a mobile application where we allow users to change their pictures through jigsaw puzzles. We try to make it really fun and exciting with different levels of difficulties. And also you can send your pictures to the world, to a random user. And you can receive a picture from a random user. You will just see the country where it comes from. If it's from anywhere in the world, you don't see who sent it that you, just where it comes from. And today we release a new version. We've been there for like a year or so, but we were looking for partners and we did not really, we were just building the idea and today we really have a final product with a brilliant graphic um, user interface. And uh, we are basically now looking for feedbacks, thoughts, and really um, feedbacks on the user experience people have on the app. So we have created a private Facebook group where people can give their, their feedbacks and their thoughts and other ideas from our marketing for the overall project. So if you are interested in knowing more about the project, maybe you would like to join our Facebook groups and really let us know what you think because you really are looking for a great environment. Cool. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay, so we're a room majority of founders or people in tech. Who here has, uh, has succeeded within their business? We're all on our way, that's fine. Who here has had a failure? Cool. And do we feel, just generally, that we learn more from success or failure? Failure. failure. Yes, that was the question I was asking, the answer I wanted. Uh, I'm really, really pleased to introduce our final speaker for the evening, um, Dan Rice from Hobsey. Um, I won't give any other details away, uh, but Dan is going to give us all of his key lessons um, in his startup funeral. <laughs> I've gone right past you, Dan. You got the clicker? Uh, I'll just use the keyboard, I think. Hi, guys. Well, uh, thank you all for joining me here today to celebrate the life of Hobsey. <laughs> I'd known Hobsey for four years, big part of my life. Unfortunately, she died earlier this year of a severe revenue related illness. Um, <laughs> So this is Hobsey's story. So Hobsey uh, was a social network, uh, actually much, much like the chap that just did the rapid pitch then was saying, we, our angle on social networking was you want to connect with people that share your interests, not necessarily people you know, like Facebook, or people you, you want to connect with on a professional level like LinkedIn. Um, so we were all about, you like knitting, I like knitting, let's connect around our knitting get to that in a minute. Um, so business was started in 2011 by myself, Alex and Andy. Um, we're all techies uh, and we all clearly love crafts. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, the idea was conceived on the Oxygen Accelerator program, um, which if you don't know what that is, it's a three month uh, intensive program where you can come up with an idea they give you some business mentoring, they give you some cash, um, and the idea is at the end of the program, you come out with an, uh, an investable business. So we actually got onto the program with a different idea. Um, it's called Host My Portfolio. So it was uh, portfolio hosting for graphic designers, photographers, um, and after kind of two weeks on the program, we met 100 different mentors and they all went, love you guys, love the tech you've built. The idea's a bit done, it's a bit shit. Can you think how you can apply the technology elsewhere. Um, so we thought, okay, we've built a platform for showcasing what you do um, on, a, on a sort of professional basis. Can we, can we make something where what you do in your spare time can also be shown? So that's what we did, and that's where Hobbsy came about. We want to be a platform for you to show what you love doing in your spare time. That then quickly morphed into a, a social channel. Um, so uh, the product Hobbsy was born. Um, near the end of the accelerator. We had a couple of weeks to go. In the first week, we got 13,000 people 
registered on the platform, we were like, yes, it's working, good decision. Um, and we looked at what, what those users were doing and we thought it might be, you know, more, uh, should I say, uh, manly related hobbies. It's three blokes running the site. We thought that, that the, the, the people would be attracting would be, you know, be people showing their football or whatever it was. But actually it was overwhelmingly uh, female and uh, handcraft hobbies and so knitting, sewing, cross stitch, that sort of stuff. Um, so we... Uh, we pursued that route, and that's kind of the, the angle the product took. Uh, but then we we were out of cash. Uh, that 15k soon went. Um, but at the end of the oxygen program, in fact, in this room, uh, they filled this room full of investors, and they asked every investor to vote on who their favourite uh, business was, uh, and we won. We won 75,000 pounds, and then we gave 68,000 of it away to charity. No, not, not to charity. We uh, we gave it away to the other teams on the program. Um, kind of felt that was the right decision. Everyone was nearly out of cash, so we split that money. Um, in hindsight, it was a pretty poor decision. It's been as every other business went bump in about four months afterwards, but there we go. Um, but karma. Uh, we then did get some investment. Um, so a couple of months after that, in July, um, we got 100,000 from some local investors. Um, and that enabled us to um, get an office and push forward with the products, grow the user base. Um, and that's what we did. And then we were out of cash again, uh, 12 months later, um, and it was a pretty bad time. Um, so Andy, one of the co-founders who I've known since school, um, he, he decided he had to leave. Um, so that was pretty, pretty tough to deal with. Um, and we were in talks with different investors, but we just we just couldn't get everyone to agree on various things. Um, and we'd also, at this point, committed to uh, a new larger office. We'd already hired some people, um, so it was kind of shit or bust. We had, we had to get this money. Um, and thankfully, got it again. Um, so in September, we got uh, did a £300,000 round. Um, so that was money from my existing investors um, and some new ones. So now, before that, it was it was still me, Andy, and Alex. We used the bulk of the money for marketing, um, but now we can actually get uh, a, a team on board and get some people that actually like crafting. So we got you know some brand advocates, and it was very good. Um, this is our little team. Very cheesy photo. Uh, this was at the launch party for uh, the Hobbsy Commerce uh, platform, which was the idea. Of the investment round was to uh, actually start making some money like a business should. Um, at this point, we've grown users, grown users, but uh, money seemed to be uh, a big problem. Um, so we, the idea was that we'd let people take what they were showing on Hobbsy and sell it. So, you know, I, I knit a blanket, put it on the Hobbsy, and we called it the Hobbsy Bazaar, put it on the Hobbsy Bazaar, and people can buy it. Uh, unfortunately, that was a massive flop. So we had a big launch party, we got loads of press there, built the products, and we didn't sell one thing. Not one thing. Um, th there's many reasons why, why that happened. Well, we think that happened, um, but we sort of felt like we couldn't, we couldn't wait around and keep trying to push it and push it and push it when it clearly looked like it wasn't working. Um, so we thought, okay, we're going to experiment. Three of us are techies, we like building products. Um, so we, we went about building quite a few different products um, on the Hobbsy platform. So we had an API, so all the user stuff was already done. It was just a case of plugging that into whatever we thought may work. So we had all these different products, Find and Craft, How Make Me, uh, Crafts Calculator, Vidihow, um, some mobile apps, some web apps. Um, and actually what we found, ridiculously, was Hand Make Me, which was a marketplace, a lot like the first marketplace we uh, set about doing, was the, the one thing that was actually working. Um, we went down a slightly different route with it. So we, we made sure every seller that came on the platform was vetted. Um, you know, we didn't let any ship photos go on there. Uh, everything looked really, really good, um, which is one of the, the big problems we felt we had with the initial marketplace. Um, and yeah, it worked. We did, we did 30K in revenue. We'd done no revenue before. So that was in uh, three months. Um, it was looking really, really good, uh, and we, we got featured in TechCrunch, that was great. Um, we did a deal with a big issue, so shop.bigissue.com, 
redirected to their shop on Handmate Me. It was really, really good. Uh, and then we died. <laughs> um, because that all happened too far down the line. Um, you know, we, 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 we were nearly out of cash by the time this happened. You know, that was 30k in revenue, not 30k in profit. Um, and we'd already been doing the rounds up to this point and we just, we didn't have enough interest. We'd, we'd already given uh, a fair bit of equity away. People weren't that interested in us giving the amount of equity away that we needed to do to get the round that we wanted to do. Um, and I was just, I was tired, to be honest. We were all tired. We, I don't think we could go through um, the, the, the patch where you have absolutely no money again. Um, so yeah, we, we called it a day uh, in March. Um, so I think I've got like one minute left. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of lessons that I've learned from this, um, products and marketing alone aren't enough. We're, we're three techies. Uh, I think that was ultimately the biggest failure. Um, I think we needed someone that could go and um, you know go and hustle, go and do partnerships. So the big issue partnership was was a massive driver of traffic for us, and we didn't do enough of it. If we did done that a year ago, and we had someone out there doing this sort of thing, um, then I think we would have been in a different position. Um, don't pivot away from your itch. Um, to this day, I'm still not sure why we all thought yes, crafts, knitting. That's what we love doing. <laughs> It's, it's hard when, when the chips are down and you're not solving a problem you really, really want to solve for yourself. Um, it becomes quite difficult and it's quite difficult to sell it to your market as well, um, which is why it was so important that we got some people into the business that did actually love doing that. Um, uh, it seems really obvious, but yeah. Um, and then finally, focus on revenue from day one. Um, we got really caught up in getting investment, getting users. Um, that was kind of the sole focus. If we did both of those two things, uh, we'd be a success. Uh, it was completely wrong, and it's the, the wrong way of going about it. Um, and if I could turn the clock back, we would, we would focus purely on revenue from the off and then worry about the other two later. Um, so, yeah, I hope kind of you've got something from that. If you're looking at fundraising or doing B2C or whatever, then you can have a chat with me afterwards. But, yeah. Um, you can chat with Dan afterwards, but we do have some time allocated to chat with Dan now, uh, which is even more exciting. So, a lot in there. Um, anybody questions? I'm sure there's lots in there. Yes, yeah. uh, oh, thanks, yeah. I'm Brendan from Sunwall.com. Um, just like to ask, what was your strategy and how did you get 13,000 registrations in your first week? Uh, Facebook advertising. Okay. So, we, um, we basically set aside a chunk of the cash that Oxygen gave us to uh, just blow on marketing at the end. So but we took quite a uh, programmatic approach to it. So, you know, we, we, we probably spent 200 quid just working out different formats of ads, different targeting, and then we spent the rest of it on just, just getting those okay. users on the ads to work. Any other questions? Yes, Ria. I need the camera, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, you do, because otherwise the camera doesn't yeah. get it. Oh, yeah. Um, what was the actual effect of your co-founder leaving in? Do you think if he hadn't have left, things would have turned out the way they did? Um, it, it was, it's a, that's a really difficult question. I mean, it, it, there, was, there was quite a lot of tension between the three of us um, at, at certain points because we're all techies and we all disagreed quite a bit on various things. It wasn't, it wasn't a bad end, he didn't leave because of that. Um, but when, when he left, that tension did did go slightly, but then we were a developer down. So uh, until we could cover the gap, um, you know, n nothing product-wise happened for for that period. But yeah, me and him are still great mates. I see him every week, and yeah, it's uh, it's all good. good. Uh, yeah, can we um, get this down here? I'm not sure you're going to need it. Maybe we'll do it in the future. Uh, are you happy? Tried to make it work as long as we did, or do you wish you'd given up sooner? Uh, there, were, there were definitely times when I thought, why, why are we doing this again? Particularly when, you know, sold my car and everything else, I own, call my dad, can I move back in with you? you know, times like that, you're like, why, why am I bothering? Um, certainly the months after that, when you've got money and it's still not looking great. Um, but no, I think I've, I've learned quite a lot from it, and yeah, no, I, I, I think we. I think we gave it a good shot and I don't have any regrets about what we did with it. It just, it just didn't work and it wasn't going to work. So, 
Yeah. Right. Can we go straight to, to Dan? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting how you tried the Hobbsy Bazaar and you said, oh, well, that didn't work. And then the the Hand Make Me was also a marketplace and that yeah. did work. So what was the kind of, could you compare and contrast? And yeah. Why did it suddenly turn around? I think um, with Bazaar, the proposition was really confusing because it was so interlinked with Hobbsy. You kind of had to understand what Hobbsy was. This is from a, a buyer's point of view, certainly. You had to understand what Hobbsy was to get what Bazaar was and why why these products are good. You know, they're ethical. They can see who's made them. Um, whereas Handmade Me was a standalone product. Um, it was branded. We, we started to brand it like Hobbsy and then just moved it straight up on its own. Um, and the whole kind of seller review thing. So the approach of Bazaar was that you know, it was really, really easy to come on. Uh, there were no listing fees. Anyone could come on, sell whatever they wanted, basically. Um, and you just end up with really, really, really poor quality products that no one wants to buy. Even if they're, you can see they're handmade by Julie in Bedford. You know, like, no, one, no one cares. If you look shit, they're not going to buy it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no offense to Julia, but <laughs> we've, uh, we've probably got time for one more question. Um, and directly behind you, Peter. What have you been announced? Uh, I've, had, I've had a holiday, which is a, an amazing thing. You should all try one sometime. Um, I'm just consulting at the minute, recharging the batteries, getting some money back in the bank. Um, and then, yeah, maybe give something a go. Uh, six months, 12 months, something like that. Uh, yeah. Do we have time for one more, or he's looking very relaxed, which is a nice sign. I'm sure there's another. Yes, I can go to Sean from Truculus. You mentioned specific amounts of money that you received at various rounds, and then uh, towards uh, a little bit later, you said that you it became not as interesting for you because uh, there wasn't enough equity. So, um, uh, well, how much equity did you give away on each each of those uh, uh, figures? Uh, so, in by. By the time we did the last round, myself and Alex were left with uh, 40% between us. Um, I, I can't remember specifics of what we did each round now, but there's something like, I think we probably gave away like 30% in the first round, something like that. But Thank you. Um, are you still relaxed here? Can we go for one more question? Yeah. One more question, yeah, Matt. Thanks for the honest presentation. Um, did you think you spent too much time developing the product and the, the platform and not going to market and getting it out there and seeing what happens? Um, I think we I think we got the product to market, well, the products when we tried different things um, fairly quickly. I think the strategy behind those product decisions was probably wrong a lot of the time. Um, and like I said, you know, I think actually products I think we got we did quite well. Um, marketing, I think we had a good plan there. It was just everything else, including strategy, including you know all, all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, we were quite product focused. But that was our strength, and that's what we had to do. We didn't have a business person on the team. Nobody on the team liked doing this sort of thing, which is you know it, it didn't help. Um, so yeah, may, maybe a little bit of that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Two more questions. Oh, two more. Yeah. Right, okay. Slightly more. That's before. Right. If we can, oh, one uh, more. If we can go to, uh, sorry, go to Nick. Um, sorry, Lee at the back. So you mentioned you, you recharging the the bank, and then you're going to do something again. So uh, this whole experience, even though it was a complete failure, and you sold your car, and you wanted, you probably wanted to punch some people several several, several times. You still want to do it again? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I. I, I probably wouldn't do B to C again and I wouldn't go down the route of having a business that needs investment to work. I'd, I'd, I'd change that approach. Um, but yeah, yeah. Why don't you try and support me? <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm not sure if you want to go Okay, um, next pitch. <laughs> next question. No. We're wrapping it up. Guys, we're wrapping it up. We've got a massive round of applause for.
and uh, Dan, Dan is far too modest to, to do a plug himself, but he is actually working under Raisu Tech. Um, his surname's Rice. Raisu is Rice in Japanese, if you ever forget it. Raisu Tech. So um, Dan does the most amazing work, and we're really pleased to have him working on some of our projects as well. So looking up and, and just look at some of the products. They are phenomenal. Um, now, we are drawing slowly to a close. I can't quite yet smell the pizza, so it can't be here yet, but it's getting close. Now, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Mike Skelton to the stage, um, and Mike is our final one-minute pitch. Uh, Mike, I'm afraid to say, when I asked where you're from, I was only told Dallas, Texas. So firstly, thanks for coming, and welcome to Birmingham, and I hope to hear more about what you are well, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I am from the Dallas, Texas area, but I'm from a city called Richardson, Texas, which is the high-tech hub of the Dallas metropolitan area. Uh, so what I would like to do today is uh, just tell you what I'm doing here in, in the United Kingdom and uh, what my role is. So my, my job is to attract foreign and direct investment to the Dallas and Richardson community. And so I'm an economic development person. However, I am a former entrepreneur. I have started three st uh, software startup companies. I've sold two of them. Uh, I've had some successes, uh, minor successes, and I have a couple failures. So I can empathize with all of what you're going through here. Uh, but uh, why would you want to pick Texas as a, way to, a place to go as opposed to Silicon Valley or Boston, New York? Uh, it's a much, a dynamic, much more dynamic uh, uh, area of the country. It's growing at an extremely fast rate. During the past 12 months, we've hired, uh, we've created 33% of all the jobs in the United States. Uh, Texas is very dynamic. It's got low tax rates. It's got a very good ecosystem for customers that you want to sell to. And my job is really to go out and create relationships. I'm here at, at Innovation uh, Birmingham to create a soft partnership between the two organizations. We have an innovation team back in Richardson who can help companies soft land when they want to come to the United States. So we have uh, lawyers, CPAs, uh, marketing people, all the kind of support services you would need when you want to expand to the U.S. We're not here to steal companies. We're here to help companies that want to expand to the U.S. market. And um, I'll be around for a little bit here if you'd like to sit and talk about what we could do for your company as you, as you get to the point of expansion. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's interesting to listen to some of the stories that we hear about here. I've been there, done that. So um, I feel your pain. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And um, hope, I hope I can answer any questions for you after this conversation here. Thank, thank you. you <laughs> Uh, we're drawing to a close. There's two final things to do. Firstly, um, is to announce the winner of Wackar's uh, uh, competition. So if you'd like to come to the stage, Paul, are you crazy enough to give him your data and sign up to Supermill? Right. That might be a prize for you. We've got five people uh, placed order. I'm going to start from the worst. So, Hampton <laughs> Contractors, you know the first one, the fifth one. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> Peter, uh, Ria, Nick, and Mike is the winner. No, I can't, I can't, Trust. I, I can't take it. I can't take it. Give it to someone else. Someone else who? Um, next is Nick. The next, the, next the next one. Nick. No, was, was it Nick or Ria? No, Nick. Nick. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> right. Also, uh, please ask uh, the uh, the pizzas today, we've ordered them from Superman. So, uh, Snappy Pizza is the uh, base. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martha.